Okay, Lord God, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for your word which you've given us, Lord. We gave you for the word in the flesh whose blood uh, paid for our sins. And we're eternally grateful, Lord God. We pray you're with us. We give this time to you, Lord. Let your spirit dwell among us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So I want to go over a, an important exhortation we hear in Hebrews 3. And um, I just want to start off by reading it. Hebrews 3, verses 5 through 12. It is written, Now Moses was faithful in all God's house as a servant to testify the things that would be spoken. But Christ is faithful as a son over God's house. We are of his house, if in fact we hold firmly to our confidence and the hope we take pride in. And here the author continues in verse 7. He says, Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, He's quoting Psalm 95. He says, Oh, that today you would listen as he speaks. Do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion in the day of testing in the wilderness. There your fathers tested me and tried me, and they saw my works for 40 years. Therefore, I became provoked at that generation and said, Their hearts are always wandering, and they have not known my ways. As I swore in my anger... They will never enter my rest. The author continues and says, See to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has an evil, unbelieving heart that forsakes the living God. An amazing message by the author of Hebrews. But I want to focus on the actual event he's referring to. What is this rebellion in, in the wilderness? What is this thing with Moses? And of course, it has to do with the 40 years, the wanderings. And I want to touch on the climax of that 40 years, or the climax that led to them not entering the promised land. First, I want to go over the promises that were given. Um, well, there's not much else. Anyway, so I want to go over the promises that were uh, given to this promised land. It's, I'm not going to go over it today. I kind of have to shorten the message today, but Genesis 15, the promise is given to Abraham that he will be the father of many nations and he will have his, own, his people will have their own land. This is, um, especially if you think about it, Abraham was away, you know, part of the secular world. And to have a land to him, you know, what an amazing thought. But furthermore, that promise gets reiterated in, in, in Exodus 3, again, verses 16 to 17. And, it's, and essentially that promise gets reiterated, reiterated to Moses. And Moses knows this promise, right? They know this. But here they are in Egypt after some 400 years. And they're suffering, they're in this state. And then here's that promise again, reiterated to Moses, which Moses will take down to Israel. Can you imagine this group for 100 years being you know, treated not as the first class citizen, but the last class, even though they more and more do work? I think something we can kind of at least understand in our history. But um, what an amazing thing to hear that promise be delivered. We're finally going to get our own place. This is it. We're going to be free from the Egyptians. We're going to be free from ungodly things. We're going to go to our own land where we can worship our own God and not have to pay for that. So this promise gets reiterated to Moses in Exodus 3, uh, Deuteronomy 10. Um, and uh, So that takes us to the context where we're going to take, talk about today. So by, this, by the time I'm going to read Numbers 13, Israel's already been out. They've been out there in the wilderness. They've failed quite so many times over and over again. And, well, let's just read where this goes. So in Numbers 13, verse 1, The Lord spoke to Moses, and he says in verse 2, Send out men to invest, investigate the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the Israelites. You are to send one man from each ancestral tribe, each one a leader among them. So Moses sent them from the wilderness of Paran at the command of the Lord, and all of them were leaders. So this is it. We're going to start getting the land, and we're starting with Canaan. This is the beginning of the delivery. This is, you know, uh, December 24th, Christmas Eve. We're getting the presents, so on and so forth. So this is happening. So verses 4 through 16, they list all the leaders, one from each tribe. I'm going to skip that. We're going to land on verse 17. And it says, When Moses sent them to investigate the land of Canaan, he told them, Go up through Negev, and go up into the hill country and see what the land is like and whether the people who live there are strong or weak, few or many. 
if the land is good or bad, whether the cities are inhabited, are they camps, or are they fortified, uh, whether the land is rich or poor, uh, are there you know, forests there? And he says, be brave, bring back some of the fruit of that land. And then the author adds here, now it was the time of year for the first ripe grapes. So he's saying, look, guys, go check it out. What is it like? Can we take them on? Is it fortified? What are we looking at here? You know, this is the land we're going to take. We need to do an investigation. So verses 21 to 25, they go, and they come back. And we're going to land this in verse 26. They came back to Moses and Aaron and to the whole community of the Israelites in the wilderness of Paran at Kadesh. They reported to the whole community and showed the fruit of the land. So they brought the grapes back. They told Moses, we went to the land where you sent us. It is indeed flowing with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. And milk and honey is an idiom. It's plentiful, bountiful, fertile. Uh, it's a callback to the original promise where he, the same verbiage that was used for Moses. Anyway, he says, verse 28, but the inhabitants are strong. And the cities are fortified and very large. Moreover, we saw the descendants of the Anak there. The Amalekites live in the land of Negev. The Hittites, Jebusites, Amorites live in the hill country. And the Canaanites live by the sea along the banks of the Jordan. So what we're seeing is a very heavily fortified land. Not only that, but it's not just the Canaanites that are there, but the other ites, Jebusites, Hittites, etc., etc., etc. And then the descendants of the Anak... So, Caleb silenced the people. Caleb stands up, and he says, in verse 30, Then Caleb silenced the people before Moses, saying, Let us go up and occupy it, for we are well able to conquer it. And this is the attitude of a God-fearing person. Let's go take it. And after hearing everything they just said, he said, Nope, we can do it. We can take that land. And what's that confidence behind him, I wonder? So anyway... 31, but the men who had gone up with him said, we are not able to go up against these people because they are stronger than we are. Then they presented the Israelites with a discouraging report of the land they had investigated, saying, the land that we pass through to investigate is a land that devours its inhabitants. It means uh, the land is very warlike, it's not friendly for peace, you know, it's kind of like the non-America where everything is so non-violent, well, at least in war, is, you're prone to war. And another way to interpret that is that there's some cannibalism involved. It could be that the Canaanites were cannibals, but the point is, it's not a friendly land. This is not a place we might want to go to. All the people we saw there are of great stature. We even saw the Nephilim there, the descendants of the Anak came from Nephilim, and we seemed like grasshoppers both to ourselves and to them. The descendants of the Nak, Raphaim, etc., etc., these are all Nephilim, these are the giants from Genesis 6. Giants are a huge problem up until the time of kings. We see them through the book of Joshua and, the, and Judges, and finally when David takes one out. So they're saying, look, Caleb's like, let's go, and they're saying, actually, let's not go. Uh, Caleb, did you not see what we saw? Did you not see the giants? Did you not see the fort? Did you not see the craziness that is happening there? This is a terrible idea. So uh, they rebuttal against Caleb. Then all the community raised in a loud cry, and the people wept that night. So the promise was going to happen. We're going to get Canaan. We're going to begin the conquest. We're going to get the land back. And then this happens. And there's fighting inside the, the, the team. Caleb is saying, let's go. They're saying, no, this is a terrible idea. It's impossible. And it seems to the Israelites, this dream is broken. The promise is broken. That's what it seems. And all the Israelites murmured against Moses and Aaron. And the whole congregation said to them, they murmured against them. They say, if only we had died in the land of Egypt. Or if only we had perished in this wilderness. Why has the Lord brought us into this land only to be killed by the sword that our wives and our children should become plunder? Wouldn't it be better for us to return to Egypt? This is one of the saddest passages in the Bible. Utter, pathetic defeat. 
no faith, no strength, no courage. They're gone. They just said, that's it, it's over. And to top it off, verse 4, they say, so they said to one another, let's appoint a leader and return back to Egypt. Let's appoint a leader and turn back to Egypt. At this point, Moses and Aaron and Joshua and Caleb, they're the only ones who remember what the Lord had done and remember what had done in the past and to remember to keep applying it into the future. And they plead. They plead to the Israelites that if if it's the Lord's will, they're going to get it. What's the problem? Did we not see what we had seen? Did we not see this, all these things that led up to the wilderness, the fire tornado, the splitting of the thing, the food coming out of the sky, the viper snakes? <laughs> none, none of, what happened? So they plead and they plead and they plead to, um, to the people. In verse 9, Only do not rebel against the Lord and do not fear the people of the land, for they are bread for us. That's the rebuttal back to the people. These guys are nothing. They're like bread. We tear them apart. Pieces. Done. What are we, you know, he's trying to bring them back to who, which God do we serve here? Their protection has turned aside from them. But the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. And that is the message those four have back to the Israelites. Do not fear them. Verse 10, however, the whole community threatened to stone them. They wanted to th- stone Moses. Okay, this is like them people trying to stone Jesus. Okay? <laughs> I'm not, not saying equivalence here, but just an idea. They wanted to kill him. But the glory of the Lord appeared to the Israelites in the tent of meeting. So God, God shows up. And the Lord says to Moses, now this is one of the rare few times God shows up to more than one person. Okay, this is rare. When people say, how come in the Old Testament God shows up to people? No, 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 no. God shows up to one guy. That's the, that's the tradition. That's, I mean, that's what we see. That's the plan. That's the mechanic. Here he shows up in the middle of everybody. And Moses is there, and he turns to Moses, and he says, how long will this people despise me? How long will they not believe in me? In spite of the signs that I have done among them, I will strike them with the pestilence, and I will disinherit them. I will make you into a nation that is greater and mightier than day. So think about it. The Lord is there. He turns to Moses. And he's talking to Moses and everyone else is there. He says, this is the la- how many times, how many times they don't listen. They don't listen. They don't listen. They don't do what I'm doing. They don't, they're disobedient. He says, I'm going to make you, from you, a land. So he's shunning, rejecting the rest of Israel in front of them. Talking right to Moses. Out of you, I will make a country. Uh, out of my people. I mean, this is utter rejection. So Moses begs God to forgive them. He says, look, you know how they are. (laughs) To quote uh, Stephen and Moses back there, stiff-necked people. And this is all believers. I'm not sticking to this group here. He plagues and says, look, if we go back to to Egypt, they're going to say, oh, look, look look at this God of Israel. Look at Yahweh and look at these moronic Israelites. Oh, they made such a big deal and there's dumb little plagues. Now they're coming back here. What kind of God is this? And that's the plead Moses says to God. So then eventually we get to verse 22. The Lord says, I have forgiven them as you asked, but truly as I live, all the earth will be filled with the glory of the Lord. Verse 22, for all the people have seen my glory and my signs that I did in Egypt and in the wilderness and yet have tempted me now these ten times. The ten times is not an actual number. It means in completion. They've fully, completely rejected me. They've disappointed me completely. This is the attitude the Lord has. They've tempted me, rather. They will by no means see the land I promised, an oath to their fathers, nor will any of them who despise me to see it. He says, they're not going to the promised land. Sorry. Covenant is broken. You guys broke your end of the deal. He says in verse 24, only my servant Caleb, because he had a different spirit and has followed me fully, I will bring him to the land where he has gone and his descendants will possess it. And sure enough, That's what happens. In Numbers 20, 
we, I'm sorry, in Numbers 15, uh, 14, as we've read, we see this act that the author of Hebrews is talking about. We see this rebellion in the wilderness, and this is it. God is fed up. He says, you know what? Sorry, guys, it's not happening. Game over. You failed. And what happens? Joshua shows up. They start taking the land. Israel goes through an obedient cycle. They're obedient to the Lord. The Lord gives them the land. They win the land. And they're settled in. Everything's good. And they fall back. Their generations go back to apostasy. Cycle over and 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 over again. But eventually, they do get there. And Caleb does get there. And he's a lot older man now. He's a lot older man. And um, he succeeds where Israel fails. Now, it's interesting. One of the one of the big things that, pun intended, that challenged the Israelites were the giants. And these were the descendants of Anak, so on and so forth. It's very interesting how a whole Israel army was fearing them. But by the time we get to David, a young shepherd boy, by himself, and it's not his courage, it's not his strength, it's not his dexterity, it's not his aim, it's not his strength, that wins him over this giant Goliath, but it's faith in God. And that's the fundamental lesson that Israel failed to learn that David highly succeeded in. He saw, and think about it, you have Israel and the land of Canaan. You have David and the Palestinians. You have the giants. You have the war territory. It's not a good place to be in front of those uh, Philistines. Okay, there's, there's David looking at him, and what does he do? Instead of doing what Cain, uh, what Israel did, hey, look, it's, it's a big guy, I'm not going to take him, I think we should just kind of, you know, not do this, come at it some other way, maybe we can, you know, bring some fruit in or something. He says, no, 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 give me that sling right now. Give me the sling, give me the stone. He put five in his pocket and he went up. And it was complete faith driving him. And we all know what happens. He slays Goliath with one rock. And then he takes his own sword the sword of the Philistine, and decapitates him. And that is an example of faith. That is what the Israelites failed in the wilderness, and the author of Hebrews 3 is trying to talk about. When they had failed me, he said, when they had failed me in the wilderness, and that's what the author is saying, don't be like them. Let me reiterate that first verse in Hebrews 3. Now Moses was faithful in God's house as a servant to testify things that we spoken but Christ is faithful as a son over God's house. We are of his house. And we are part of that house. And we should exercise the same faith as David did. Whatever, we've heard this preach before, whatever our Goliath is, whatever our Canaan is, let's not forget what the Lord has done and not what the Lord won't do. Nothing is too hard for the Lord. Amen. Amen. So with that, um, I'm going to end the message. Pray us out. Lord, we thank you for your word. Again, we thank you for the blood of Christ as we sung about. We thank you for the confidence that we can approach you, Lord God. We pray for courage. Um, I know it's easy to look back and read and judge Israel, but Lord, we are not so different. We are the same human being creation as we were back then. We pray, Lord, that you give us faith, and by faith we honor you and glorify you with our lives. Let not the worries and anxieties of this world be our Uh, be our Goliath or be the giants. Let us be like David and honoring you and being faithful to you, Lord God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Amen.